Another great resource is just to call property management companies in that area and ask them, how's the vacancy doing? How's the rent growth coming? What apartments do you know are coming online? Because property management companies will know all about that because they've probably seen something sniffing around before. And then ask them what amenities are, are needed in the market. You can, you can in a 15 minute get a lot of Q&A done as far as what you need to then look back at the project you're looking at and go, man, these guys are really doing a good job of meeting the need. I feel comfortable that their experience has already showed them what the market needs. And out of that experience, I can now feel comfortable making that investment. Tim is one of the most authentic and genuine people I've ever met. I sincerely believe he's coming from a position of giving and that means a lot. You're going to make huge progress. Welcome, everyone, to today's Capital Raising Show. I'm your host, Tim Mai. And uh, today I have a special guest expert on the line with us. Uh, he's special because I don't get to interview a lot of developers, real estate developers on this show. We interview a ton of value add experts, everything from multifamily to self-storage, mobile home parks and such. But super, super excited to interview Shannon Robnett. Uh, Shannon spoke at our event a month or so ago and did phenomenal. The audience loved his topic. And so I uh, invited him on here so that way we can learn more about you know, the, the, the whole war of new development and especially how we raise money for new development because I, you know, I tried a little bit and I did have more challenging time <laughs> raising money for a new development than I did for value add. So let, we'll, uh, we'll get into that. Shannon has over 27 years of experience uh, involved from start to finish on over $425 million in construction projects. Uh, including multifamily office uh, buildings, city halls, fire and police stations, school, industrial, mini storage, uh, a ton of different type of assets, as you as you guys uh, can see. Uh, and um, Shannon is very knowledgeable and dedicated his time to share his expertise in delivering top quality projects that bring numerous passive income streams to his syndicate partners. With that, let's give Shannon a big welcome, y'all. Woohoo! Yeah, Thanks, we Tim. need to we we can we need to have our own official like Zoom welcome where we do some <laughs> kind of a, a Zoom clap. But um, Shannon, thank you so much for being on here with us today. Glad to be here and uh, glad to meet each one of you. Awesome, yeah. So let's start out. You can share with us a little bit about your uh, your business model. What does that you know? What does it look like? Um, yeah. Well, you know the. There, there is a big difference between development and value add. And the, the reality comes down to uh, the resume, right? I mean, when a bank is looking at, at an asset that's already functioning, uh, they can value it, they know what's going on, um, but it's about being able to deliver, you know? And what we found is that over the years, it, it's not as quick to build a development resume as it is to build a resume in other assets because it's an acquisition game, right? I mean, if we look at the last, I'm in a, I'm, I've got a 190 unit apartment complex under construction right now. Uh, we, we put the con the property under contract in uh, September of 2018. And so we had to take it through the city. We had to get the entitlements. We had to draw the plans. We had to look at what wow. the market had to offer us and what our competition was going to be. And we had to find out what our niche was. And then we had to move that forward all the way through the construction process. During that, we had COVID, we had all the fun with that. Uh, but the, the bank is really looking at, can you deliver? And when they're, when they're looking at that, the underwriting is a lot more stringent. Uh, they're looking at, you know, can you, can you sustain market changes as we've seen? What is that going to do to the project? And in a lot of ways, um, I, I like the development space better because what it allows you to do is it allows you to have a lot of third-party people double-checking your math. So when you're looking at it and you're saying, hey, you know, I'm going to buy uh, this apartment complex over here. The rents are a thousand bucks. We're going to spend 10,000 a door. We're going to raise the rents to 1300 you know, there's there's some checks that go on an appraiser goes out, looks, are there $1,300 units in the market? Yes, check. Can you get it done for $10,000 a door? We would hope so, but there's not a lot of verification there. 
And, and so there's a lot, it's a lot easier to do that process. When you're talking about the development process, um, you know, you've got your land acquisition, you've got your entitlements, you've got, you know, the, the drawing of the plans, but in a lot of ways, I find it to be simpler to be the original value add than a value add, because we take the sticks and stones, we put the tenants in it and um, we create the original value add. And so when we're doing that, we're looking at what is the market today? And we've got a two to three year window of what the market may be. And if all of you that are watching know what the market's done in the last three years, right? But when we look at where we're going, we have, we kind of take a different approach because we really build the project backwards. The first person that I talk to when I want to put a property under contract is the property management company. And I go out and I find out what's missing in the market. What does the market need that it doesn't currently have? What is the what is the amenity that everybody wants that you can't really get into a value add property? What what is my secret sauce going to be? And then I look at the rents, and then I began to build I begin to build my budget where I know that if my property is going to have a value of fifty million dollars, then I've got to build it all in for about thirty eight, uh, and I've got to be able to do that with with this kind of a budget, I know what percentage my plumber should be, where my excavation should come in at, all for round numbers. And so then at that point, we begin to get the subcontractors involved. And I know what you're saying, Tim, well, wait a minute, didn't you draw the plans first? And, I, and I'm going to ask you, and I hope there's no engineers in the room that'll get offended by this, but who would draw a better set of plans? Who would understand the plumbing better, an engineer mm. or an actual plumber? And so we have all of the all of the subcontractors work with the engineer of their preferred choosing to draw the plans because they already know the budget. So this really prevents us from coming into a situation where we said we had thirty eight million dollars to do the deal with, and we get our first round of bids back and we're at forty one. So now we've got to go through and we've got to cut money out of the budget. We've got to re-engineer. We've got to redesign, and all of that just takes time and it's expensive. And so if you build, if you do a design build type of a process where you're coming in, and you're saying, hey, we understand that we've got to do this for a thousand dollars a fixture on the plumbing. And we can do that if we can design it this way. And then you're going back and forth. You've got property management involved going, well, that looks okay. We really like this, da, da, da. Then you're able to come up with a plan. And your plans are done. You're within budget. You know where you need to be. And you're able to execute on that plan. Now it's about, being with reputable contractors that you've said that are going to be able to meet those timelines that are going to be able to get things completed that are going to be able to take care of those things in a, in a general contracting firm that can execute because as you guys know um interest can be very expensive in today today's world uh i think on our project right now we're cranking close to uh, we're cranking a deficit right now on 190 units of about a uh, $223,000 a month right? Now, all of that interest reserve is set aside, but we've got a lease up schedule. We've got performance to make. And if we're missing that, we could burn through a million dollars in five months of interest payments, right? And so when you've got all this put together, you really have the formula and the plan on how you're going to be able to develop this property. And you're going to be able to, to execute on this property and you're going to be able to profit from this property. In today's world, now, fast forward with what we all know about what's going on in the multifamily space, that there isn't enough product. Uh, there's a lot of product coming online right now nationwide that's all coming on at the same time. So everybody's fighting over the same people. But that's not, that's not going to solve the problem long term. We also know that you know, we're seeing single family homes, are the home starts are off. We're seeing that kind of slowdown because more people are being priced out of single family homes into tenancy. And so we're seeing a lot of those things. So you've got to be a little bit of a fortune teller. But, you know, the project that we've been discussing so far, uh, you know, our underwriting was at $1,700 for rent. And we're, we're achieving 21. So as, as rents rise, so, or as interest rates have risen, so have rents. Uh, and so we're, we're in a good position there, but we've got appraisers checking us. We've got, you know, we've got the banks checking us. We've got a lot more in the deal. The big concern that everybody has with development is it does take a lot more equity uh, to do a development deal. Uh, we're typically at the 40% development or 40% equity on our developments. 
And in doing that, you also have a period of 24 to 36 months during a development process that there is no income and um, delays in, in producing that income can be expensive. That is a cost to everyone involved. So that's just kind of how we put our team together and how we look to eliminate those problems and take care of those issues based on, you know, what I've, I've learned by falling out of the truck a few times. <laughs> that's very cool. So uh, I want to, I want to take a, a higher level uh, view here. Uh, so, you know, I know that you've done a number of different uh, type of new developments. Are you still um, doing a lot of different asset types or are you more focused on one asset type like this multifamily uh, that you're working on right now? Well, we've got a long history of doing industrial uh, and industrial is often overlooked, but we do industrial and multifamily. Gotcha. Okay. Like your company, do you guys go out there, source the land deals, uh, and then, you know, do all like do the whole A to Z from sourcing the land deals all the way to the vertical construction? Uh, or do you uh, find people who have land and find people who source, you know, does the land acquisition and then you just come in on the actual horizontal development and the vertical construction part of it? You know, we've done it always. I am a uh, fourth generation realtor. My son is a fifth. So we're, oh, wow. we're very familiar with land acquisition. Um, and, you know, as we all knew um, 24 months ago, the only way to find a deal was to find it yourself. Uh, you know, so we've done a lot of that, but now we, we also... We're pretty well networked after 27 years. Um, so we have people bring us a lot of stuff. We look at a lot of things um, and we're getting ready to break ground on a, on a industrial deal. Uh, it's, it's two buildings. It's 80,000 square feet of industrial uh, in Florida. And so I've gone down and I found a general contractor there that's local, uh, long reputation, good company. And we're working with them to actually complete the construction so that at the end of the day, I'm not trying to set up a whole team in Florida and create new relationships with subcontractors. We've gone to find people in that market that can de deliver on that and, and have that reputation already. I see. Okay. So what are all the different markets uh, that, that you work in? Uh, we've got a deal in Washington. We're in Idaho. We're in uh, Texas. We're in Florida, and we're getting ready to acquire some uh, projects in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, in North Carolina. Oh wow! Okay, so pretty much all over. Uh, well, not California, New York. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not completely yeah. insane over here. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you are a fourth generator uh, uh, uh generation i'm sorry a fourth generation realtor um so like you got into this business is this like your only this real estate your only business you've ever been in and just kind of went in uh when you were younger or? yeah i was i was born into a real estate family my dad was a builder um turned developer and my mother was um was a th third generation real estate broker she was a broker for 42 years um, oh, wow. and so I grew up in the business, but I, I, I always wanted to do something different. You know, it's, it, I think it's kind of like every kid that grows up and watches his parents and you go, wow, that's horrible. I mean, I see all the stress and I see what you guys are doing and I don't want to do that. Um, but you know, you, you, um, you soon see when you're involved in real estate, you soon see all the benefits of it. And so I, I, I quickly abandoned my college dream. Uh, and uh, went into construction, and uh, I, I built uh, all kinds of stuff in doing that. And as I was building stuff, I began to see even more value in that because every time I built something and I finished it, I stopped getting paid. But the mm. person that I built it for just started getting paid. And there's projects <laughs> that I did almost 30 years ago. That owner is still getting paid. Oh, wow. And I haven't gotten one more check from him. Right. <laughs> I totally yeah I've um, I flipped a lot of houses in my career I've been in the single family home side for 21 years uh, I've I've done a lot of fix and flips done a lot of wholesaling and yes I get that feeling all the time of like man I should have kept more 
<laughs> it's, uh... Well, you know, and, and we do that, Tim, because we, we sell when the time is right. And I actually did this one time. It actually made me feel a little bit better was I started with the first things I bought and sold and I traced where the money went, right? Mm. That was the only way that I could make myself feel decent because I had sold some things, but I'd forgotten what I had done with that money. And then that That's asset good. had grown, right? Uh, yeah. There was a few stops with Uncle Sam that I wasn't real appreciative of where my money <laughs> stopped, but you know, we try to avoid that. All right. No kidding. All right. So you you had explained a process, and it sounds like a long process from acquiring the property in 2018 to now, you know, doing the it's still under construction right now. Um, and that's very typical of a of a uh, new development project, right? So is so to build a multifamily as an example, um, from the time you acquire the property to the time that it's done, is it about a four year window? Yeah. I mean, if you're going through the complete entitlement process, right? I mean, in the in the current environment that we're living in, I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of deals that are entitled. They do have plans. Uh, people are stuck on the equity piece. Because, uh, you know, they're now they're not able to get it closed with 20 percent down. They've got to bring 40 percent. And that's maybe a little bit beyond their reach. And so there's different reasons for that. But but if you're taking a piece of ground in this particular case, we spent 18 months in the entitlement process. Right. Mm. Um, and one of the tricks that I have is I don't actually pay for the land. I don't actually close on the land uh, until it's completely entitled and I have building permits 60 days out. So I, I don't see. own the land for that whole time. In doing that, you incur a lot of a lot of upfront costs that you don't necessarily need to, but there's ways to figure out, you know, there's ways to be creative with that. Um, and just, you know, having done this for a, a long time, it's it's helped me to understand what to and not to do. Right, right, right. So you um so you work out with a seller kind of like an option um agreement or no. I actually put the land under contract. Okay. Um, and so we put the land under contract. The contingencies are approvals. Um, and, you know, one of the things that everybody loves to get into is they love to get into the price debate, right? Uh, well, I think it's only worth this. Well, I think it's worth that, you know? And what I always work out is how to get the seller their asking price, right? And granted the last, I mean, 21 and 22, everybody gave the asking price plus, <laughs> but that's not the world that I've lived in most of my life, right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the interest rate environment isn't either. I did my first development deal in 2001 with a 9% uh, loan, right? So what we do is we, we, we allow the seller to win, right? The win is that I'll get you full price. Then our win is that we, we pay that at entitlement. And then when it comes time to actually... Uh, put up the earnest money, uh, we put up a promissory note. And so we have a promissory note that at uh, at the time that we receive our approvals, we will convert to cash within three days and release to the seller, right? And so the seller understands. And, and the reason we do that is a quick argument that's, why, well, if it's contingent, if I don't get my my way and the city doesn't allow or the county doesn't allow, why would I want to leave that much money tied up in escrow in a non-interest bearing account, couldn't a personally uh, personally guaranteed promissory note from me be enough to be sufficient for that? And again, it goes back to track record. It goes back to, you know, being able to, to, to show that you have the, the net worth to do that. And then oftentimes, uh, you know, we, we just keep moving on. So, so while that, that land deal took 18 months to get entitled, um, I closed on it in month 18 uh, and began construction in 20. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense because I was going to ask you, you know, with, with the, the whole process being from acquisition to entitlement, to horizontal, to vertical, um, does it make sense to almost like, um, you know, uh, you have one entity that buys it from the other, right? So, um, uh, so like one entity buys, bought the land, and then sold it to the entity that's doing the entitlement and then sold to, from the entitlement, sold it to the entity that's going to do the development. 
Um, would you break it out that way? Or I mean, I like the way you have it for sure. But well, the, uh, yeah, and, and you could do that. What my investors see is they see that whatever price I acquired the land for, put it under contract is what they're in the deal at, right? And so we do have costs and fees for getting it titled, but mm -hmm. it's it's based on performance, right? So if we don't get the land entitled, we don't collect any costs and fees, but they're minimal because our our big goal is to get the project built. That's where the real money's at, right? The entitlement isn't the game I play, right? Uh, so I, I had too much fun with that in 2008 when the market turned and I had a, a subdivision that I had entitled and was building out. And then there was no buyers for housing lots, right? So I've always made sure that I am my complete vertical solution from the entitlement through the finished roof. And, but if you were to do that and everybody dipped a little bit and you got closing costs and sales costs and title insurance and all that, it would likely get a little bit too expensive. But what we do is, mm -hmm. is when we're typically in the approval process, planning and zoning uh, staff and uh, planning and zoning members will approve it. And then three weeks, four weeks later, the city council will approve it. So during that three or four weeks, we've been priming the pump for the last six months. And then during that last three or four weeks, we raise capital. Closing. We close on the land. Our building plans are, are being finished off. We're ready to go. Uh, and then we, we get pick up our building permits and we get cracking. So we, we've got it kind of streamlined where, where we're not needing a lot of investor capital until we know we have a project to build. The investors know that, hey, you know what? This is 18 months ago land pricing, right? And yep. in most market, that's a good thing. That's not like it is today where land prices are quite a bit less because of where values are at and what the, what makes a deal happen at this point. So when you're when you're all done with that, you're just transferring it one time from the closing. It goes right into from the seller right into the entity that's building it, and from there everything rock and rolls. Right, I like that a lot. Um, so I want to talk about the term entitlement because I have a piece of land right now, and I've been talking to se some silver engineers to help me you know, get entitled because my, my thought process is I'll get this thing entitled as a, uh, as a, um, uh, either single family or home or duplex, uh, community and then sell it at entitlement. And it seems at least to some of these civil engineers I talk to, uh, and even some developers, there's not a clear definition or, uh, of what entitlement means. Is that correct? Or I'm just talking to the wrong people? Yeah. And what you really need to have is you really need to have something that's ready to draw the duplex plan on and submit to the city. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, and, and there's multiple steps in there, especially if you're doing single family homes, right. In this, uh, in this particular project, we've got two multifamily uh, apartment complexes under construction right now. One is self-contained on its lot. So you drive in, it's a parking lot. You got the, you know, the, the, uh, the buildings around all that. There's, there's no site work. There's no civil improvements that need to be done in a single family or a duplex style subdivision. You've got all the public roads, the sidewalks, the sewer, the infrastructure, all of those things need to be put into the project. And that is another step. And so what you're doing is you really have two different things. Um, if you've got the ability to get it to finished lots where a builder can then come purchase it from you, build the duplexes, build the houses, whatever, that would be typically what would be considered normal in a subdivision uh, entitlement. So you're going to have the approvals from the city. You're going to have a civil set of drawings. You're going to have a landscape plan. You're going to have all the sanitary facilities will be drawn out and delineated. You'll have any agreements that are necessary for will serve letters uh, guaranteeing that, that, you know, when you're done with the subdivision, uh, public will take your waste to provide you with the fresh water, that, those kinds of things. And so there's, there's different things there. If you go to a land planner, he's going to say, well, I'm going to get it entitled for a hundred houses. I'm going to get that blanket overlay because right now it's zoned, let's just say it's zoned uh, office and we're going to rezone that to residential. So we've got the zoning coordinated and maybe we associate a number with that. But then there's a whole other process of drawing the subdivision, drawing in the streets, dividing the lots, creating that. 
and then you've got your preliminary plat that's ready to record. Once you record your preliminary plat, you go in and construct everything, and then you record your final plat, that matching your preliminary, and then you're ready to sell the lots and or build on it. So there's there's different things involved, um, and and there's different ways to do that. If it's if it's all done under one and it's got a private street, you can do the infrastructure as you go. So you're putting in the streets and the roads and they have to be complete at the same time that you have houses ready to occupy. So there's a lot of, there can be differences in what entitlement is. And just to clear it up for everybody, it's not what most of our children think. <laughs> it took no kidding. a minute, Tim, but you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's good. So let's talk about, uh, you know, the actual capital raising uh, part of this, um, the profile of an investor that are that's interested in investing in a new development, it's probably a different profile than someone who investing in a value add, because uh, the you know they see more progress there. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Well, and and you know, there's really three types of investors in my opinion, right? There's the one that wants the tax benefits, right? There's the one that wants the cash flow. And there's the one that wants a. They think they want the cash flow, but they've got a hundred grand. And they, when you quickly do what a six percent cash on cash does for a hundred thousand dollars, they quickly realize that they are the third type of investor, which is an appreciation investor. And typically, you know, that is a you know mid thirties of a person, early forties. Uh, their career is doing fine. They've got things that take care of the tax problems for them, uh, but they're really looking to grow their net worth. And so in a, uh, a multifamily project uh, ground up or an industrial project ground up is a great way to do that because they're able to value, uh, you know, getting the sticks and stones done, getting it turned into an income producing asset, and then usually at some point transacting from there in a tax efficient way and going into the next deal. I see. Okay. So we're looking for, yeah. So we're looking for the third type, the the ones that are looking for appreciation because that's where right. the new construction gives us the most amount of appreciation. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Because if you look at, you know, you, if you look at, let's take out 19, 20 and 21, those are, you know, even part of 22 was a little bit of an anomaly with where, where interest rates took funding, uh, where people were able to really leverage uh, much higher than normal. 16, 17, you know, an average cash on cash return in multifamily was in the mid sixes. Uh, and a, a, an exit IRR on a five year deal was probably uh, 14, 15%, right? That was kind of industry average. Over the last couple of years, that's escalated, that's climbed. We've now seen it kind of come back the other way. Uh, and people are, are, struggling getting out of bridge into something else. But where we've seen development is usually in the mid to high 20s uh, on a very consistent basis. We had, uh, we've had we had exits as high as 104% in 18, 22 months, um, but that had as much to do with the market as anything. But we've, we've been very, very consistent in an IRR of around 25 to 30% in, in new development. And so you're in that progress process for 30 to 40 months. Uh, you know, you're not seeing any cash flow. Uh, but at the end of that time, you've got the project built, you've got it stabilized, you're transacting with another entity, and um, you're moving on in a in a in a manner that that makes sense. Right. Okay. So when you know when looking at investing with a developer, um I'm going to switch role. I'm going to put my role, uh, my role is a, as an LP investor, right? I'm mm -hmm. looking to invest with a developer. Should I look for one that specializes in a specific asset class uh, or one that specializes in a specific location, geography, you know, uh, geography um, or, or, uh, or one that just, you know, like yourself that has just, you know, decades of experience in a variety who, who, like, you know, how should I best decide that? Well, and I think, I think you're correct. I think you're looking for somebody that has experience in the market that you're looking at. Um, I think you're looking at more than just the developer. You're looking at 
uh, the contractors. You know, you're looking at are are we a new general contracting firm or have we got a history of doing this? You know, because there is a timeline delivery that comes along with that. Because if your contractor falls four months behind and you're flipping units, that's not that big a deal. But if your contractor falls four months behind and you're waiting to release a building, uh, you've got 24 units that are held up uh, and you're missing that cash flow. So there's a lot of different things that you need to look at, but experience is really, really, really imperative. Uh, the next thing you really got to look at is you've got to look at the market because you're adding to that market, right? And so if you're sitting there in a, in a, in a market that's got 7% vacancy, buying a value add deal isn't that bad of a deal. But if you're looking at a market that has 7% vacancy currently, and not only is this deal getting ready to start, but you know um, somebody else has another deal that's getting ready to start, what what other permits have been pulled? You could wind up with a 12% vacancy in a market pretty quick, right? And so you really want to look at that because you're not just raising rents on what's there. You will be top side of the market. Any development that comes in is always the highest priced, right? New is always more than used. And so when you're when you're doing that and you're looking at how that happens, you want to make sure that there's room for the rent growth, right? One of the markets that I've looked at several times, and it's very difficult for me to make a pencil, is Houston, right? Houston's growing, but it's a very blue collar growth. Right. When you really break down the demographics of what Houston's doing, it's very blue collar in how it's coming together. And so putting units into the marketplace that are twenty three, twenty four hundred dollars is going to be really difficult. But that's really what is demanded of new construction. And so you've got to really understand your market demographics better because you're not simply taking brand X. You know, you're not taking the, the, the cabana in, you know, and 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 rebranding that as the three flamingos, uh, you know, you're you're really you're doing more than just painting it a different color and putting new deck chairs by the pool. You're pushing the envelope on what rents are there, what amenities are there. And so you you really, as an LP, you have to know that the people that you're working with know what they're doing. They've done this before, they understand that market. And then based on that, you also need to, in my opinion, you need to understand that market, right? And that's not real difficult. Most of the Marcus and Millichaps or the Colliers or uh, Cushman and Wakefield, they've all got re uh, multifamily reports on their websites for the usually the particular market you're looking at. So you're able to get a lot of data that's updated quarterly that will give you a lot of insight into that market. So you're not kind of jumping in blind and you can understand what's needed in the marketplace. Another great resource is just to call property management companies in that area and ask them, how's the vacancy doing? How's the rent growth coming? What apartments do you know are coming online? Because property management companies will know all about that because they've probably seen something sniffing around before. And then ask them what amenities are, are needed in the market. You can, you can in a 15 minute get a lot of Q&A done as far as what you need to then look back at the project you're looking at and go, man, these guys are really doing a good job of meeting the need. I feel comfortable that their experience has already showed them what the market needs. And out of that experience, I can now feel comfortable making that investment. Very cool. That's awesome. Um, and um, so I've, uh, you know, I've, I've been talking to some developers and it seems like uh, a lot of developers they're they're good at working with the city and you know working through all of that process, but they're not great at capital raising, and they're 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 looking for you know uh, partners to come in and help with the capital raising side Absolutely. of 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 the business. Um, those um for for you, do you do majority of your raise in house or? Do you partner with others to raise or both? How do you how do you go about it? You know, I started capital raise. I only started capital raising in uh, late, uh, well, actually early nineteen was my first opportunity to capital raise. I had worked with a family oh, wow. office before that. I'd worked with single check writers before that, and as our development company grew and our appetite grew, we began to see more of a need for that because we had more projects than we had you know dollars available. 
And so we've we've definitely um, worked with people in the capital raise space. The biggest issue with the development space, Tim, is as you know, it's a different space. And so if you're if you're a capital raiser and you've been focusing on 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 preaching the value add or the the cash on cash return, the the monthly distributions, if that's been your jam, your investors are tuned into that. And what I've seen a lot of people not succeed at is all of a sudden coming up and going, hey, daddy's got a brand new bag and we're going to do this instead of educating people why this is a good thing. Right. And so if you lead with that education piece to your investors, you're going to find you're going to have a whole lot more success in, hey, I've already heard that. Hey, by the way, I've interviewed this person. By the way, I've talked with this guy uh, and here's some facts. Here's some st statistics. And most capital raisers are doing a fantastic job of keeping people updated on the market, right? Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden they go, hey, uh, multifamily, well, not today, we're going to do industrial, right? But if you're educating people why a diverse portfolio in real estate makes sense and why mm -hmm. the industrial space is like the bond of the real estate market, right? It trades at a higher cap rate. It's a triple net product. I see Lewis over there banging his head on the wall. He loves this one, right? Uh, but it's it's a triple net product. So when insurance goes up, the tenants pay it. When, when property taxes go up, the tenants pay it. So it's a very safe uh, asset. It will do excellent for cash on cash. It will not explode in value like the multifamily had for the last couple of years. But then as the multifamily is experiencing the trends that it's experiencing now, it's also not participating in that. So it's a very stable thing. And it's one that uh, the people that invest with us uh, love that product when they're looking for cash flow. When you've got your people that are, you know, hitting the, the, their their golden years, they're starting to look at the exit from the job. Uh, they're starting to set themselves up in the position where they can now count on that check month in month out. You're getting a tenant class that has balance sheets. They understand business. They're personally teed. They're signing three to five year leases, even ten year in some cases. And we have a little section in our lease that nobody really paid attention to for a long time. And I've been doing it for about 20 years. But in our rent escalation clause that gets signed into the lease, regardless of the duration, it says that the rent will go up 3% and or CPI, whichever is greater. Now, in 2018, nobody gave it a second thought, right? Nobody said anything. But in 2022, my tenants took it going into 23, they took a 9% rent increase, right? Because CPI, consumer price index, said that we had experienced that much inflation. And so mm. now all of a sudden they've got a 9% rent increase. This year, it looks like we're going to take about another 5% as well. So everybody's going to be really excited about that. But then when you look at what that a tenant, a tenant in a multifamily space is giving 35% of their income to the rent, right? A tenant in in the uh, industrial uh, flex space is usually got their, their location at less than 10% of their total uh, revenue. So a 5% increase in 10% of their product is not even going to register with them. They'll grumble and complain, but they'll pay it gladly. And so right. if you're educating people like that, about why you need to look at industrial and why you should diversify and maybe pick up some of this stuff. And maybe we're looking at a market where industrial is still very much in need. I love Houston for industrial, right? I've got a couple of deals down there. And yet we also do this. We, we do these two. They're both, they're, they're symbiotic and they, and they offer the same tax structures and things like that. You can really educate your people and with, with that, bring them along. So when you flip the deal in front of them, they're not surprised and going, oh my gosh, what, what, Tim, what is this? When did you become a developer? I, I didn't know anything about this. I don't know. And a confused mind does nothing. Gotcha. And it's, I mean, it's interesting that you, you know, um, you, you go into both the multifamily and the industrial flex space. Cause like you said, they are two very different space, very different uh, tenant profile. Uh, the industrial now that development process is a lot faster than the multifamily one. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, for sure. Well, and, it, and it's it's kind of like anything, you know, Tim. You've got to have your savings account, right? You've got to have your operating fund. You've got to have your rainy day real estate, and then you have you, you know your multifamily that I wouldn't consider to be speculative, but it is 
there's higher risk, there's higher reward, right? As we've seen insurance rates explode right now, everybody's yep. struggling with that because you can't just turn around to the tenant and go, hey, by the way, uh, your rent just went up 500 bucks a year because of your insurance, right? But in the multi or in the industrial space, I can't, right? And so when people start to look at that, different asset classes are as important as a diversified portfolio in anything. Gotcha. All right. So when you're looking for developments, do you focus primarily like within major cities? Do you go on the outskirts uh, at all? Or what's your you know, what's your buy box when, when you're making, you know, when you're deciding where to build? You know, the first thing I do is I look at markets and I identify markets before I ever look at a deal. So mm -hmm. I have nine cities that I'll do deals in across the nation. And th those are the only ones I'll look at. So if you've got a deal in Ohio, I don't, I'm, I'm not looking in that area, right? Not that it's a bad market, but I have very specific parameters because my window is long, right? So, if, I mean, look, if you came across a deal in Ohio today, you could get educated on Ohio, do what you want to do, have things happen really quickly and be on to what's next and have the value add completed probably before I'm half done with my project. So I have to really know that that market is in a growth pattern. I have to really know that that market is adding uh, jobs that are that are able to afford what I'm building. And so I've limited that to nine cities across the nation. I look at those nine cities. Um, and then from there, we kind of go deal by deal. Hey, what's the land cost? What's the tenant mix in the area? What's the rent we're going to garner? What's the, you know, what's the cost of building? But the reality is when one, when you're looking at development, you really need to kind of take the McDonald's mindset. Location, location, location. Because the reality is if you build anywhere in Houston, we're just going to use Houston from the good side to the bad side, the, the worst side to the best side, building costs are going to be the same, right? You might have to put a little bit more gingerbread on it, a little more stucco. Maybe you've got to put a bigger amenity for package in because it's in this certain area. But bottom line is the costs are the cost. Then you're looking at it going, well, if you've got to drive 60 minutes to downtown, you're going to get less rent than if you're 10 miles away. And when your land cost in development only represents about 8%, 9% of your total costs on a typical apartment complex, what's 10 and a half or 11% if you've got that McDonald's location, right? If you're right where everybody wants to be. So I typically look at location very, very closely, and I will pay be right in the center of everything. Uh, the project we got going right now is, is two miles from a freeway uh, on ramp. It's right across the street from a 58 acre park. It's a mile from city hall. It's a mile and a half from downtown of this small suburb of Boise. Uh, it's two miles from Costco. It's literally in the heart of suburbia. And I, I paid for it. And it's, and it's leasing up just like I'd hoped because of what I paid for. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah, as you were talking, and I look at the three different types of investors that you had mentioned before, uh, it sounds like, you know, for us as, uh, you know, um, we, I call I call us capital allocators, um, you know, th that uh, it sounds like the, 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 the type of education that we really need to be putting out there is diversifications so that we you know the, where so that when we have an opportunity whether it's value add whether it's new constructions like our investors are already um, open to the idea of diversifications instead of a, a very specific you know narrow assets and a narrow strategy it's it, it sounds like is that correct shannon well you know my belief is that as investors, we need to have diversification, right? And then if you're looking at that, teaching your LPs what that looks like is always going to leave you with a bigger buy box, right? Because if you continue to say, hey, I only do value add, I only do it in Houston, this is all I do. The minute you show them a deal in Dallas, they're going to go, Tim, what's going on, right? The minute you go to Kentucky, they're going to go, whoa, 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 what's this, right? But if you can educate people, and this is what I tell people all the time, you got to be four months downstream, right? If you're going to get into the value at, or if you're going to get into the industrial space, that's great to start educating now to offer a deal in March or April, right? 
get people used to the idea that, hey, Tim's been talking a lot about industrial. You know, mm-hmm. Tim's been talking about it so much, I've even looked at it, and I see that that's a good deal out there, right? I see what he's talking about. I can track the performance. It doesn't come to me as something new all of a sudden. And now I'm trying to go, well, what's Tim trying to do? Oh, you know what Tim's trying to do? Tim's trying to make money for himself and he can't do it in what he was doing. So now whether or not that's true, that's where they're going to go, right? So when you're able to continue that education process and let people know, hey, industrial is phenomenal right now. I mean, seriously, right? All kidding aside, if you're looking at the industrial space, uh, I mean, cap rates are seven and a half, eight percent, even nine, eight and a half on deals. You can get long-term life insurance money in the low sevens on ten-year fixed. You know, you can get a, an asset that is uh, that is. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you want to paint the outside of the buildings; the tenants pay for it. You need to resurface the parking lot; the tenants pay for it. The expense are not yours. What a great place to be in the Bidenomics we got going on, right? So when you sit there and you look at that, you're making that your educational point as far as how you can put that out to people as to why you want to look at multiple things, right? Uh, even the, the office space right now, right? The office space is terrible. Well, is it? Office space can be great in certain markets that are still exploding. Uh, market sp- uh, office space in Nashville, Tennessee is, is, is really hard to find, Right. So there's different things. And if you're educating people on that, then when you find that deal, they're able to go, you know what? Tim actually does know what he's talking about. And the partners that Tim's working with on that deal, they really know what they're talking about because you can see their track record, right? Right. And that's really why I'm so hung up on, you need to know what the track record is of the team you're joining. You need to know what the market is of the team you're joining. And then once you know those two, then you're in a position to look at the deal itself. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. Uh, I have another question for you. You know, with with the time horizon of these development deals, are there uh, websites or services that you use to kind of give you a um, you know a um, um, a view of what that market would look like? You know, four years later. You know, I'm old school. Uh, I don't think you can replace humans yet in this, in this place. Uh, so I go to property management. I go straight to mm. the largest firm in town. I go straight to the guy that's got the, you know, the three complexes right around me. Uh, you know, I go in and I ask them, uh, and I, you know, I, I go there. Um, I, I, I make, uh, relationships with brokers that have been in the market 12, 14 years, you know? Uh, that understand what that community needs. I get with specialists in the area um, that really can speak to what the long-term growth is. Another excellent place to go is City Hall. Go talk to the community and uh, what are they typically called? The community growth advisors or the economic uh, development committee. Those guys will tell you what's coming. And when you can look at that and go, okay, here's what's coming to the area. Now I can feel comfortable putting $50 $50 million to work for four years, knowing that, you know, Samsung's bringing a plant to the area, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and you're, cause, cause what is, what is developing job wise is going to affect you uh, also. Right. And so you're going to want to make sure that, Hey, the trend is that uh, rents are climbing. Uh, the trend is that wages are climbing. The trend is that people are moving into the area. Those are all the kind of trends that you want to see so that at the end of the day, you can see that for your mark, right? Because trends don't change automatically, right? If you right. look at, you know, last year, California lost a half a million people, right? That trend has been going the other way where they've been importing less and less and less into California. And now all of a sudden it's continued that downward trend. And now the uh, the second largest thing that they're exporting out of California after strawberries is people, Right. And that's that has that's just a statement of what's going on. Based on that, we can look at where they're going, and then we can follow that trend and and try and stay in front of that. Yeah, that's very cool. I love that. I love that deep local study that way because you're right. I mean, real estate 
it's not a it's not a national thing it's not it's a very localized uh thing so every market's uh you know act very differently and the trends very different uh so no. very very good and it is a hands on game you know it really is it i mean we we all struggled but 24 months ago to get a hold of a broker of any kind right uh mortgage or uh real estate <laughs> Just because everybody was so busy, but when right. when you really have built those relationships in that market, and you can buy somebody lunch and and understand what they see coming, that have been there for let's say a minimum of ten years, you're going to get a really realistic picture. Right. Very cool. All right, Shannon. Well, you have been a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much uh, for the listeners that wants to reach out to you, connect with you, partner with you, invest with you. Where would you like to send them? It's really easy. It's just shannonrobnet.com. Uh, so it, it's pretty simple. There's even a link to my calendar there. If you want to jump on a call, I'd love to chat with you a little bit, um, you know, and, uh, you know, but you can see our projects there. You can see the developments we have going, the investments we have. Uh, you can just kind of, yeah, take a look at that kind of stuff. Uh, Shannon, again, thank you so much uh, for your generosity and you know, yeah, your wealth amount of knowledge that you're sharing with us today. Really appreciate you for being on the show today. Thank you. 